You know, there was a very striking moment for me talking to a Rohingya religious leader. Uh, and he said, the situation for us Rohingya is getting so bad and we have so little hope for the future that we are planning self-defense. It did seem that this situation was ripe for escalation, a very violent escalation. You know, people didn't pay sufficient attention. So when I was 18, I ended up teaching English to an armed rebel group in eastern Myanmar. Uh, I'd intended to go just for a month, but I ended up spending two years in the jungles. Um, and I ended up learning Burmese, teaching a bit of English, um, and learning a lot about the country and, and the struggles. After more than a decade of working for the ILO and the United Nations, uh, I was looking for a, for a change. Uh, I wanted to focus more on the conflict, on the politics. Uh, and so in 2008, I started working uh, with Crisis Group as their new uh, Myanmar analyst, uh, really pivoting to that, to that conflict uh, mitigation work. The elections in 2010 were not free and fair, and they brought about a military-backed government uh, that many people felt would be just old wine in a new bottle. But the country really started to open up, and there were 10 years of problems, but problems in a context of hope in the hope that things were getting better, that the future would be better than the past. But it didn't last long. That hope evaporated very quickly. And in 2012, there was a spate of deadly intercommunal violence, anti-Muslim violence. Uh, it affected Rakhine State very seriously. Uh, and, you know, Rakhine State had been something of a backwater, even within Myanmar. And there wasn't much analysis about it. There wasn't much of an effort to understand uh, the grievances of the Rakhine Buddhist majority, or uh, the terrible, terrible discrimination uh, and living conditions of the uh, Rohingya uh, Muslim minority. Politics was being denied to the Rohingya. Step by step, they were being excluded from the social and political life of the country. They were being banned from participating in elections. They were being banned from traveling even beyond their village. They were being discriminated against when it came to public services. And so it was becoming impossible for them to continue following this political path. And so we started uh, putting a lot of effort into uh, research in, in Rakhine State. I traveled there many times to try and understand the underlying dynamics. I talked to government officials. I talked to leaders of the Rakhine community, of the Rohingya community traveled across the border to Bangladesh to talk to people there, including refugees and civil society organizations uh, working for the Rohingya, and built up this kind of picture uh, of a crisis that was coming to the boil. You know, there was a very striking moment for me talking to a Rohingya religious leader. Um, he hadn't talked to anyone uh, outside of, of, of the region uh, before. He hadn't really talked about uh, his uh, plans for the future before to anyone. Uh, and he said, the situation for us Rohingya is getting so bad and we have so little hope for the future that we are planning self-defense. We're going to start organizing self-defense. And it was clear what he meant. He meant a violent self-defense. And that was really striking because this was not someone who was just sort of venting anger. He was a very determined, uh, very well-spoken, very thoughtful person who was giving a warning that because hope had evaporated and because this had been going on so long, the mood within the Rohingya community was starting to shift and younger people were starting to to, to think about dispensing with the nonviolent approach that the Ranger community has taken throughout the decades, largely, and he was talking about something different. And he said, we hope the international community will understand us and support us, but if they don't, we will continue on our path anyway. And so it became clear to me that something serious was happening, and we felt that if there was an organized resistance, armed resistance forming among Rohingya communities, that this could trigger serious uh, military action against that community. And there was a very high risk that that would result in atrocities. In 2014, we pushed the UN and donors to drop sensitive ethnicity and religion questions from the census that they were supporting but to no avail. 
But our warnings were validated when deadly violence broke out around the census in Rakhine State, and the Rohingya were not, in the end, enumerated. We also urged the UN to carry out contingency planning for significant further violence in Rakhine State, particularly against the Rohingya. But a subsequent UN inquiry established by the Secretary General uh, into the organization's uh, actions in Myanmar found that the organization had not taken such warnings seriously enough. The result was the terrible atrocities that we saw uh, in 2016 and particularly 2017. I think that shows one of the challenges of early warning in conflict prevention. It's one thing to recognize the signs and to issue the warnings, but to be effective, they have to be acted on. And that's very difficult. Uh, there are a lot of impediments to action. Sometimes it's a lack of political will. In other cases, it's just inertia. There are so many moving parts in the international system that have to come together for meaningful action to be taken uh, that often it just doesn't happen. Rakhine State has not been one of the parts of Myanmar that's been particularly affected by the violence following the coup. It's, it's been relatively calm in Rakhine State, but the coup itself has deeply uh, undermined the hopes of the Rohingya community, the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, that they will be able to return home because the perpetrators of the violence against them are now running the country. These are very dark days for Myanmar and it's easy to lose hope, but there are many hopeful signs as well. What's particularly uh, important is that a new generation of young people have come to the fore and taken on leadership positions in the, in the anti-coup movement. The coup has created an environment where a new politics is possible uh, and it's a new politics which would bring a very different future for Myanmar if it could achieve traction. I think what Crisis Group's Myanmar work shows is the importance of the deep level of analysis that the organization conducts, the importance of being on the ground in conflict situations, understanding the realities, the, the, the dynamics that are driving conflicts. And you know that gives Crisis Group the ability to issue early warnings. Uh, those warnings are not always heeded, but they are really important to allow policymakers to have a clear-eyed understanding of where conflicts are leading, where there are risks of ex escalation, and what they can do about it, what can be done to de-escalate uh, these conflicts. <laughs>